All right, so hello. Yes, I am not dead. And I'm going to be covering one D&D &D feat changes, okay, from 5E. So first thing to do, please, would help massively, please press that like button. If you look down in the chapters, there's going to be chapters throughout the whole video. I don't expect you to watch the whole thing. Just skip around to the parts you need. That's why the like is there, because it reduces the watch time. But anyway, so let's get to it. Um, all first level feats come from backgrounds. This is a massive change. Okay, this happened in Strixhaven, if anybody remembers that, and then it has been continued in books since. So it was just experimental back then. Now they're going full send. Okay, every every first level character um, gets a feat. Every character has a background. That background gets you one feat. They're all different on what they do, and we'll go through them all. Okay. Also remember that the survey is going to start October twentieth, uh, twenty twenty two. Link is going to be in the description. If it is not closed by the time you watch this video, if it is closed, the link's not there and it doesn't work. Um, if the link, if you watch it, you know, before the before the twentieth, I'll put it there the twentieth so you can come back and watch or whatever, or you can fill it out yourself. You know, either or. Um, other than that, uh, please actually fill it out. This video is basically just a prep for you to see if you like anything, and you can easily go in there and then fill it out. It would probably make the game better if they listen. I don't know if they will, but hey, they might. Um, one thing with that is they did change the critical rules back to the original. If you look in the document of the newest one, which is what this basically is, um, at the very bottom of the page, um, like page 38, they say they went back to the critical rules from old. So yay, they actually listened to us. Also, there is one first level feat that doesn't come with a background and it's lightly armored, which we'll talk about. Okay. It's very situational in which you would take this and it's broken. Um, but yeah. Also, on your right-hand side, you'll see a quick reference guide for the power level of feet. Basically, it's going to go, um, the first thing you'll see is what level it is from D&D, D&D 5e. Okay, is it a massive upgrade from 5e, an upgrade, a downgrade, or a massive downgrade from 5e? Okay, so that's just your quick reference. All right, so let's get to the feats. So our first one at level one is alert. Okay, it's just a straight downgrade um, from 5e. So let's break it down. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to read the old feet, the new feet, and then I'll cover what's on the screen. So the old feet gave you plus five initiative. You could not be surprised while you were conscious and other creatures didn't gain advantage on attack rolls against you as a result of not being seen. Okay, so let's break this down. Plus five initiative was really big. If you wanted to go first, this was a really good feat to take, especially if you were dex build, you'd have like plus 10 if you hadn't maxed decks of 20. Okay, next, you could not be surprised. Well, you're conscious, um, depending on what games you run. This may or may not come up. comes up very handful of times in the games I'm in, um, but it can absolutely deck your party, um, and having somebody with alert to not be surprised is a decent choice. And the big thing here is other creatures don't gain advantage on attack rolls against you as a result of not being seen, okay? So that basically is if the enemy's invisible, they don't get the advantage of being invisible while they attack you. Now, that's very good at high levels, not so much low levels, but it is still just a good thing overall, okay? Let's read the new one. There's a prerequisite. These are basically things that you have to be basically a class, a certain capacity, like a 13 charisma or whatever. Um, it's not repeatable, so you can't take this feat multiple times. Um, these are both two new things to one D&D, which we'll cover later in the video. Um, Initiative proficiency. When you roll initiative, you add your proficiency bonus to the roll. Okay? So, it used to be a plus five, and now it's more than likely by the time you finish your game, a plus four. Um, and that's like, you're finishing, finishing your game. At maximum, the proficiency bonus can be plus six. However, that is very high tier of games. We're talking like 16, 17 level um, game we're talking here. If you want that max proficiency bonus of six, which... Let's be honest, most of us aren't getting to. I played in one, and I'm currently playing in one campaign we've actually gotten at this level. Um, everything else is going to be threes and twos and maybe a four by the end of your campaign um, for initiative. So that's going to replace the plus five. So now it's just two, three, four. Straight downgrade. Next is initiative swap, okay? You have basically there is an immediately after you roll initiative, you can swap your initiative with the initiative of one willing ally in the same combat and you can't make the swap if you are the ally or incapacitated okay this is situationally good now let me tell you this if you take this feat and you have high decks 
what you can do is, let's say you roll like a 30, it's not unheard of, a 30 on your initiative. You can give the wizard that rolled a one, you can give him his 30, but you will take his one, and that way he can cast like fireball and kill them all because they're all grouped up and they're not spread out yet because they haven't taken their turn. That is nice. I will say that, okay? Um, basically, just right on screen. You lose your plus five initiative in favor of your prof mod. Uh, you can't be surprised. You can initiative swap, and you lose the ability to hit things that are invisible without disadvantage. So, overall, feat's been downgraded. <sighs> I kind of see what they're going here with. I'd rather get a set initiative of five, um, just on a power level. You do lose the ability to be surprised. You can't. You can be surprised now, and you also gain. And they also gain advantage on you when they attack you. Um, so this feat's not very good anymore. I will just say that. Situationally might be very powerful, but overall downgrade. Feat number two of the background feats you can get. Okay. Crafter, first level feat, periodical says none, and repeatable, no. You are an adept craft you are adept at crafting things and bargaining with merchants, gaining the following benefits. You gain two proficiencies with three different artisan tools of your choice. So basically you get tool proficiencies. Um, now this is key in one D and D they change how rolling tools works. So if you were going to use a tool in the old system, it was just straight your proficiency with a tool. So like plus three on a D 20 roll is not very good. They have changed it and reworked it to now that if you use a tool, let's say Smith tools and they, and you have to make a check. Okay. Let's say you, your DM is going to be like, I need you to make make armor i need you to make like a um investigation check plus you know your tool right so now how it works in dnd one is you're going to add your tool proficiency to the check so an example you will now roll an investigation check you will now add the plus three tool proficiencies if you are proficient in the tool so smith tools you're going to add the plus three to your roll of investigation so let's say the roll is now plus nine instead of plus six okay decent change i like it okay but basically you gain three tools Meh. Whenever you buy a non-magical item, you receive a 20% discount on it. This is very situationally useful. The only possible thing I can think of is plate armor being 20% cheaper is very nice. There's not a lot of items that cost that much. Um, most of them are magical, and you don't get a dis discount on that. Now, faster crafting. When you craft an item using a tool with which you have proficiency, tool proficiency, the required craft crafting time is reduced by 20%. We don't have the rules for crafting on what they are doing. However, usually it was like 15 to 20 gold per week for you to do a craft item. So the item costs like a thousand. You would need to do the work. You need to divide it by 20 and that will give you the weeks you need to work on it. Now that's for an individual. If you have more people, it reduces it, obviously. Um, so 20% may be nice. Um, it's meh. This feat is a new one um, from 1D and D strictly, and it's just meh. Um, if you are playing a crafting campaign with which you have a base, and you are sitting there, and you have the ability to craft items on a regular basis, I could see this being useful. If you are not in that hybrid specific situation, this feat is fucking useless. Let's be honest with ourselves. The tool proficiency is nice on a regular D&D campaign, but the discounting and the crafting are really requiring you to have a home base. Um, if you don't have one, it's not very good. So, meh, feet. Healer. Okay. Healer, they have changed. Let's see. I will read the old one. You are an able physician. You're allowed to mend wounds. When you use a healer's kit to stabilize a dying creature, the creature also regains one hit point. Basically, as an action, you could use a healer kit. You have ten uses of a healer kit, by the way. And you could use one use to go to a person that is rolling death saves, go to them as an action. Um, you don't need a spell to do this. You just use med kit and they get up with one HP. This was very handy, very nice at low levels, especially when you don't have a lot of spell slots. And this also gives the person that basically has no way of doing any healing, giving them the ability to get people up that die. Um, and it's very good. If you actually do this on a fighter and has action surge, you can go get someone up action surge and then go fight the enemy. So it's a nice thing as an action. You can spend one use of the healer kit to tend a creature and restore 1d6 plus 4 hit points to it, plus hit points equal to the creature's maximum number of hit die. 
Um, basically, this was like 1d6 plus whatever level, so like 5 or 6 on top of that. Um, the creature can't regain hit points from this feat until you finish a short or long rest. Basically, it was a one-time thing and is none. What they have changed it to in one D&D is this. Basically, if you have a healer's kit, you can expend one use and tend to a creature within five feet of you as an action. That creature can expend one of its own hit die and then roll that die. The creature regains a number of hit points equal to that roll plus your proficiency. So let's say they roll their hit die. They roll a 1d10 plus five because their con was five. And then they're going to add plus three because of your proficiency bonus. There's no limit on this, which is very good, actually. Um, and the last thing is whenever you roll a die that determines the hit points you restore with a spell or with this feat battle medic benefit, you can re-roll the die as if, if it rolls a one and you must use the new roll. Basically, you can re-roll ones on medical and healing spell and, you know, this um, particular feat um, and its medkit ability. So, for example, if they roll a 1, whenever you roll... So, basically, you have to roll it for your own hit points or a spell. It would be better if it was worded that they could yeah, they could do it, but that's not how it is. So, overall, it's technically a downgrade. Now, let's get into why. You lose the 1d6 plus 4 plus hit die once per rest for hit die plus your proficiency mod, Okay. And this is their, basically their hit dice limit. Overall, this means that you can burn their own hit dies. Um, and this is highly dependent, again, on the campaign you run. If you run the typical D&D adventure, which, fun fact, nobody fucking runs, um, which is like six to eight encounters a day, um, and you have to like three or four short rests. So I think it's like two short rests, maybe three short rests, and then like a long rest. Nobody does that. But... In that specific case, this feat's actually not very good because you're burning hit die that you would usually burn. However, if you play a more traditional actual D&D game where you basically fight, maybe get one long short rest, and then you basically get a long rest after fighting for a while, um, this can be very nice. Because after that short rest, you are in combat, you can actually go to people, well then this burns in action, but you can go to people and actually use their own hit die to heal them up. Um... That's usually a resource that's not tapped into, and this gives them this gives you a lot of hit points if you really do think about it. Especially if you, multiple people take this as a background, you can be cycling a front line with a lot of hit dice being rolled for healing. So it's it's a decent trade. However, you also get to reroll ones on hit die if they come from this feat or a spell, as I said. However, you are unable to stabilize someone and get them up as an action with 1 HP if they somehow are out of hit dice. Now, this is very bad. That's why I say this is a technical downgrade feat. Because if you go to someone and they don't have any hit die, which can very well happen with this feat because they have burned all of their hit die, um, unless they save one for whatever reason, let's just say they're out, you can't actually get them up because you don't, you can't actually do anything. Um, if you don't have cure wounds or you don't have um, a potion, you can't actually get them up. Um, so that's that's why this feat is basically downgraded. Otherwise, if they, if they took if they added that back in, the feat would be very good. It'd actually be a massive upgrade on this feat. But hey, that's the world we live in. Okay. Um, next feat, at first level that you get from background is lucky. <laughs> you can already see on the left side is a massive upgrade. So let me just read the old rules. Okay. You have three luck points. Whenever you make an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw, you can spend one luck point to determine to add an additional to roll an additional d20. You can choose to spend one of your luck points after you roll the die, but before the outcome is determined, you should you choose which of the the d20s is used for the attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. Okay. Now, an old exploit of this was basically if you close your eyes and threw a dagger, you roll two dice because you're at disadvantage. If you then burn a luck point, you roll another dice, and you choose which of the three to choose which of the three you want. That's basically how you gain super advantage on a disadvantage check. Um, if you had advantage already, then you roll this one and you roll a three, then you get to pick one of the three dice. Um, now, technically, I believe the rule is you roll two dice, um, and then you're going to burn a luck point. So then you're going to re-roll the lower one. But for all intents and purposes, you roll fucking three dice. 
Um, they have fixed this, um, which we'll get into, but they fixed that exploit, so that's no longer a thing you can do. Which, good, they actually fixed the fucking exploit. Um, you can also spend one like, hit luck point when an attack roll is made against you. Roll a d20, then choose whether the, whether the attack uses the attacker's roll or yours. If one or more creatures spends a luck point to influence the outcome of a roll, the points cancel each other out, no additional dice are rolled. If for some reason the enemy had lucky and burned it on you, that would be actually funny. Never had that happen before, but uh, that would actually be funny if a DM did that to you, but meh. Uh, you also regain all luck points when you finish long rest, okay? So lucky was already a very good fucking feat. Now it's just stupidly broken. No, not broken. It's just stupidly good. It's like the best feat in the DM. It's the best background feat you can ever get um, in one D&D. So let's read it. Prerogus hits none. Repeatable? No. You have inexplicable luck. Okay, you have a number of luck points equal to your proficiency bonus if you spend the points of on the benefits below and regain all your luck points when you finish a long rest. So now it is no longer three. It can be six. And when you start the game, it will be two. Then it will go to three and then four. So even in your regular D&D games, you will actually get a benefit of this if you get the high levels of level four basically rerolls. Advantage. Immediately after you roll a d20 for a d20 test... That's a whole separate video, not getting into it, but basically a d20 test, um, basically just what you roll in 5e. You can spend one luck point to give yourself advantage on the roll, okay? It does not say you re-roll, and it does not say you choose which of the dice. It just says you get advantage. Disadvantage. When a creature rolls a d20 for an attack roll against you, you can spend one luck point to impose disadvantage on that roll. So, you take a disadvantage. It is now very set on what you do. You cannot get super advantage anymore, and you cannot get super disadvantage? In theory, they couldn't get super disadvantage, because if they rolled advantage, and then you burned your dice, you could pick which of the three dice they, they'd actually hit you with. Um, but that's all gone. So now it's just advantage, disadvantage. This feat is still very good, and it's a massive upgrade. It's just you fixed one of the exploits um, that made it broken. So overall, Lucky got a massive boost, and I like it. So hey, I'm all for it. Next is Magic Initiate. Okay, the old Magic Magic Initiate was one of the top tier feats you could possibly get in the game. Now they've made it even better. So, in addition, so I'll read the old one. In addition to choose, in addition, so basically you choose a class, you learn two cantrips, and then one first level spell, um, and you can cast that spell at its lowest level once when you, and then you basically get it back um, on a long rest but basically you get one casting of it for free and then you can cast it again if you actually burn spell slots um and your spell casting modifier depends on what fucking class you took blah 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 so two cantrips one leveled spell that you get basically for free and then you get and you have to burn special spell slots after that now this was usually taken for you to get like find familiar um for any class was great, and that's what you took this feat for, is to get Find Familiar if you couldn't already get it. And the two cantrips just give you basically cantrips. You can take Booming Blade on a fighter that doesn't have magic at all, and then also give them a um, Familiar, which will increase their combat potential massively. Um, and then they also get another cantrip that you can fuck around with. Now, what they have changed it to is um, technically an upgrade. So, Magic Initiate. Prerogo sets none. Repeatable? Yes, but you must choose a different spell list each time. Okay? So, you have learned the basics of a particular magical tradition and choose one spell list, Arcane, Divine, or Primal, and you gain the following benefits related to that choice. Okay, what this means is that you can continuously take this feat. It's not something you could do in D&D. &D. 5e, you could not take feats over and over again. In 1D&D, &D, you can. Now, the old system, so the old one from 5e, said you had to basically pick a class and you got spells from that one. Now, in one D&D, there are three lists and you pick one list um, for the feat. So, if we choose Arcane and we later get another, and we later want to take this feat again, we can choose Divine. And for some reason, if we want to take this feat again, you can choose Primal and get every single spell list um, in the game um, for first level and cantrips. But, let's continue. Two cantrips from one of the spell lists, one of the three spell lists, okay? And then when you do that, you choose one first level spell from that spell list. You can always have the spell prepared, 
Um, and you can cast it once without a spell slot, without using a spell slot. Um, and you regain the ability to cast it in this way. When you finish a long rest, you can also cast the spell using any spell slots you have. Same as usual, okay? Um, intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma is your spell casting ability for these spells. Choose which when you select this feat. Um, and whenever you get a new level, you can replace one of the spells, which you choose from this feat with a different spell of the same level from the chosen spell. That's basically, you can replace your first level feat. Um, so if you had Find Familiar, if you had Find Familiar, and um, if you had Find Familiar and you wanted to replace it after you got your Familiar out for some reason, even though your Familiar can die, um, you could do that. You can do that now. Um, I don't think that was possible before. It doesn't look like it's possible before. So that's a good change. So technically upgraded. Um, so yeah. And also you get to choose from three master spell lists instead of just a class. So really good and actually feat now. Uh, that you get from background. It's a background feat. Remember this, boys. And girls, if anybody is watching as a girl. So musician is a new feat. I will read the new feat for you. Free wild states, none. Repeatable, no. You practice music. Mus you are a practice musician, granting you the following benefits: instrument training. You gain tool proficiencies. Okay, with three musical instruments of your choice, you can play music instruments now. Wow. After you finish a short rest or a long rest, you can play a song on a musical instrument to with which you have tool proficiencies, tool proficiency, and gain and give inspiration to allies who hear the song. The number of allies you can affect in this way equals your proficiency bonus. Basically, per short rest or long rest, you can give inspiration to whoever is in your party, um, depending on your proficiency modifier. Now, this can get a little broken in 1D&D, because it's a new feat for 1D&D. So, it combined with human party, a human gets one inspiration per day, um, gives or per long rest so one human per long rest okay you get one inspiration basically if everybody's a human and everyone burns their inspiration okay let's just say everyone burns their inspiration you're running a party of four and you have proficiency modifiers four so you're like level nine you're all human you all burn your inspiration okay if you then take a short rest use this feat you give all of them back their um inspiration and they fight on, and they can burn it again. So two inspirations per day. Two inspirations per long rest, um, basically. So if you take a short rest, and the day begins again, you have two of these. If you send a short rest, and human party already use your inspiration before the short rest. So that's just one of the things you can possibly do here. <sighs> Would I take this feat? In my opinion, not really. Again, this is a background feat, so if it fits your background, then you go ahead. If you're a bard, this actually might be very good in uh, RPG elements or story. Is it good overall? It depends highly on the party and if they use it. But a reroll is never bad uh, for a background feat. So I'll say it's somewhere in the middle for me. Not the best, like, lucky, but it's somewhere in the middle and it's pretty good. So there's Musician. Next is Savage Attacker. It is now a first level feat. I will read the old one because basically all they did was change the wording. Once per turn, when you roll damage for a melee a melee weapon attack, you can reroll the weapon's damage dice and use either total. It is now worded um, the following way. Prerequisites, none. Repeatable, no. It's a background feat. You have trained to deal particular damaging strikes. When you take the attack action and hit a target with a weapon as part of that action, you can roll the weapon's damage dice twice and use either roll against the target. You can use this benefit only once per turn. Now, this doesn't specify a melee weapon, which is a actual upgrade technically, but it's just eh. um, so you can re-roll a weapon attack if you hit it with a bow. It's not a bad background feat. It's just there's much better ones, um, and it just got reworded, so it's a little better. So, if you like Savage Attacker. Somehow back in 5e, and it wasn't dog shit, but it was. You now have it for free, and it's better. So there you go. Savage Attacker. Skilled. So, skilled in 5e was you gain proficiency in a combination of three skills or tools of your choice. Now, in 1D&D, &D, it is 
Brewing says none. It is repeatable. This is important. You can continuously take this skill over and over again and gain proficiency in literally every skill if you would like. You have gained exceptionally broad learning. Choose three skills in which you lack proficiency. You gain proficiency in those skills. Now there is a difference here. You cannot choose tools from a skill like you could in 5e. It is only skills. Okay, it's just three skills, but it is repeatable. So in my opinion, it's upgraded because it's repeatable um, and you just lose the tools, but nobody really used tools that much. Let's be very honest with ourselves. Nobody used the fucking tools very much. Maybe once or twice in your campaign, whereas an actual skill was used multiple times. Um, so there is skill. Um, as a background feat, middle of the pack, um, depending on what character build you're going for, can be very useful on rogues and bards. Um, other characters that don't gain that many proficiencies could be a very good one to have. And it is repeatable, so there is that. So, All right, that's skilled. On to the next one. Tavern Brawler. Now, this one's going to require a lot of fucking explanation from me. So, just remember, first level background feat, you get it for free. Accustom to the blah, 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 blah. In the old thing, in 5e, you increase your strength or con by 1 to a max of 20. You gain proficiency with improvised weapons. Your unarmed strikes use a d4 of damage. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike or improvised weapon on your turn, you can use a bonus action to attempt to grapple that target. Okay, so in 5e, you had to, comp you had to pair this with Grappler. If you had Tavern Brawler and Grappler, you could get advantage on hitting somebody in the face um because they're grappled and you have advantage on grapple targets the proficiency with improvised weapons and unarmed strikes use a d4 of damage was not very fucking useful there was a very specific way to do it with monks and maybe an unarmed fighter but no um no and now the new feat is there's no pre prerequisites it is not repeatable now here's the thing you're enhanced unarmed strikes and you hit with your unarmed strike and deal damage, you can deal bludgeoning damage equal to 1d4 plus your strength mod instead of using normal damage of unarmed strike, which is basically a 1d4. So, your fists just get better, straight up. Damage rerolls. Whenever you roll a damage die for your unarmed strike, you can reroll that die. If it rolls a 1, you must use, use a new reroll. There's no limit here. So, every time you hit with, the, with your fists, you could reroll it if it was a 1. We do not have what monks are capable of right now in one D and D. If you did pair this with a monk, I guarantee you, you have to go with a strength monk, which is a whole different thing. Um, maybe, or you could just, they have their own thing, but being able to reroll all of your ones on unarmed strike is fucking broken. So this feat is actually pretty good for a first level background feat that you get for free. Shove, when you hit a creature with an unarmed strike as part of the attack action on your turn, you can deal damage to the target and also punch it five feet away. You can use this benefit only once. I'll come back to that one. Furniture as a weapon. You can wield furniture as a weapon using the rules of great club for small or medium furniture and the rules of a club for tiny furniture. Basically, it just gives you the stats. So a great club, I think, is like 1d8, 1d10 maybe. No, I've never fucking used one. And a club I've also never used, so I think it's 1d6 or 1d4. Um, if you use furniture. Big whoop. Anyway, this is important to remember that, um, as I said with shove, when you hit a creature with an unarmed strike as part of an attack action on your turn, you can deal damage to the target. Now, they've changed the way grappling works, so instead of taking an action, it technically is a strike. If I remember correctly, it is a strike. So, if you hit somebody with an unarmed strike... As part of that one, you can then grapple them and then punch them again and punch them again in theory if you have multiple attacks. Just remember, on arm strike, if you hit them, you can choose the options, which one of them is grapple, and grapple them. That is why grappling is not part of Tavern Brawl, which is because you can do it automatically with unarmed strikes. Now, it's technically upgraded as an overall feat. Um, you've lost your plus one ASI. However, shove can be useful for pushing somebody five feet away. Um, and one D and D rules buff this feat basically. It might be useful on monks with the reroll on an arm strike. There is no limit. So overall, I think it's a technical upgrade. Um, it remains remains to be seen. You need we need to see the monk rules, and we need to see the fighter rules too because we don't have those either. And determine if an unarmed build is even worth it if it is worth it then this might feet maybe go up significantly but right now it's just middle of the pack 
pretty good uh, thing to have. But it's a middle of the road is what I would say. Tough. Tough's literally the same. Tough and what 5e is your hit points increase by a amount equal to twice your level when you gain this feat. Whenever you gain a level thereafter, your hit point maximum increases by additional two. Basically, you get two fucking hit points per extra per level extra. If you're using the 5e and the one DD rule set where you roll a fucking d10, and if you roll a one, you have a one for your health. Um, if you do that, which don't, but whole separate issue. Um, you gain two. So in theory, if you roll a one and you were level five, you're leveling up to level five, you roll your you roll your d6 as a wizard or a fighter or a barbarian and it rolls a one, congratulations, you have one hit point. With this feat, you now have three. Um, the one D&D &D thing is your hit max hit points increase by amount equal to twice your character level when you gain this feat. Whenever you gain a level thereafter, your hit point maximum increases by an additional two HP. Literally the same. Tough is one of those goddamn feats that's always useful. And the best thing about this is that now is a background. Um, I think of the farm background, which is funny. Um, so as a background feat, very handy that you pick up at first level. For If you basically are building any build that's going to be a tank, you just take this as a background and you're good to go. Um, there's no prerequisites and it's not repeatable, so you can't take tough multiple times because that would be stupid and insane. But hey, there you go. Tough's the same. Now, a lightly armored. Let's talk about this. I believe this is the last first level feat and we're going to talk about. All feats prior to this one were background. You could have them on a background. This is the only first level feat that does not have a background. You cannot have a background and you can take this feat. It doesn't exist. The 5e rules are basically you increase your strength or dex by 1 to a maximum of 20 and you gain proficiency light armor. This was almost the worst feat in the game. The absolute worst feat in the game was getting four weapons. There was a feat called Weapon Master, and you got four weapon prof proficiencies. You literally take a fucking class slot of anything else, you get that. But we're going off on tangent there. This was literally the second to last feat uh, of dog shit in uh, 5e. But now it has received a massive upgrade in 1 D&D. It's a first level feat, which means you do have to burn a feat slot or feet asi which we'll get to in a minute um to get it so level four eight or if you somehow start with a first level feet i think humans can choose their feet um but you don't get this as a background so you have to have a you have to have a feat that you already get at first level that doesn't come from your background if you do that this is not prerequisite and it's not repeatable but you gain the following benefits light armor medium armor and shield okay you gain basically proficiency in all of them this is a massive fucking upgrade. Not only a background feat. So it's not a background feat. You can only take this as a feat. So that's the one downside here. You get medium armor and shield proficiencies now, which was the whole fucking reason you multi-class as a spellcaster in 5e was to basically get those two things. And now you get it from a first level feat. And if a human can take a feat uh, that's not a background, immediately take this feat and be a fucking spellcaster, it's amazing. Um, you lose the plus one ASI. Again, that doesn't fucking matter here. You gain the ability to never multi-class as a spellcaster into another class just for armor, and it's just a straight buff to casters. <sighs> Apparently, people were whining that they had to multi-class. If they had to multi-class once into a different, like a fighter, a cleric, uh, a warlock, Hexblade technically got this, um ranger again they had to multi-class one time however that was deemed too punishing so now this feat exists so that you can continue to have your spell progression all the way basically usually you would have to take a level in ranger fighter whatever and then the rest in spell casting like a wizard to get the armor benefit that was deemed too punishing so now you can just take 18 levels of wizard instead of one level fighter and 17 levels of wizard. Because the, the leveling of spells was deemed too punishing. So, yeah, this is just straight buff to casters. This is just an automatic requirement for casters. And you can probably get it if you play a fucking human immediately. So congratulations. Just remember, it's not a background feat. It is one you actually get to pick up. And it's the only first level feat like this because, of course, it is. So, Yeah. Maybe write D and D one D and D and tell them that uh, if this is a little fucking broken. <laughs> um, but hey, I guess you can do what you want. Okay, 
ASIs. Let's talk about this. ASIs at fourth level is now a feat. Every single feat that requires fourth level gives half an ASI increase in a um, skill proficiency. Basically, your strength, your dex, your intelligence, your wisdom, your con. In one of those, you gain a plus one. Okay? Um, from every single level four feet, you get that. Okay? You did not get that on first levels because they all came from backgrounds, except lightly armored because that is just a wild fucking card. Fourth levels, you always get a plus one. So basically half a uh, half an ASI for per feet. Now, ability score improvement is a feat now. It is no prerequisites and it's repeatable. You all know what the fucking ASI is. You get two points to spend in whatever you want. Strength, dex, con, intelligence, wisdom, um, charisma. You get two points to put in one of them or one point in each. That's fucking what it was, okay? The new thing is just remember, every fourth level feat now um, gets half one. So there, there actually might not be a whole a lot of a reason to take an ability score improvement over just taking two feats. Again, it's highly dependent. If you need to get plus four on something instead of a plus two um, in a score, but that's up to you. But remember, feats are... They give you a lot more stuff than an ASI. Technically would, in theory, if you're not boosting, min-maxing. Whole fucking video I could do on that, but yeah. Just know that ability score improvement is now a feat. Um... And every fourth level feat gives you a plus one. So, without further ado, let's get to it. Actor. Actor is technically got downgraded, if that's even fucking possible. So, in 5e, actor was not very chosen very much because it was dog shit. Now it's even worse. So, you, in 5e, you increase your crystal score by one up to a max of 20. You have advantage on charisma, deception, and charisma performance checks when trying to pass yourself off as a different person. You can mimic the speech of another person or the sound made by another creature. You must have heard the person speaking or heard the creature make it the sound for at least a minute. A successful wisdom insight check contrasted by a charisma deception allows the listener to determine if it is fake. Okay? So, you were able to use your charisma deception before... And you're also able to use advantage on deception and performance checks to try and cross yourself off as a different person. So, very, very, very situational. I've never literally taken it. And I probably won't take it ever in 5e. And when, when D&D, &D, the rules is written, is fucking dog shit. So, in 1D&D, &D, there's now a prerequisite. You must have plus thir you have charisma 13 or plus. Um, it's not repeatable. And you gain an ASI in charisma, so plus one. That's the same. You impersonate someone now. While disguised as another fictional person or a real person other than yourself, you have advantage on charisma checks performance to convince others that you are that person. This is bad. So performance is on a general large crowd. It is not persuasion and it is not deception. Deception in the old 5e feat was decent choice because you had to actually deceive people like, hey, I need you to go do this, blah, blah, blah. I'm lying to them. Performance is you're literally putting on like a Katy Perry concert or a Taylor Swift concert. So if you're talking more than one person, if you have to be talking to multiple people and they have to be doing something performical to do that, otherwise it's going to be persuasion role. I guarantee your DM is going to be a persuasion role. Um, and you don't have advantage on that anymore. So that's bad. And mimicry. You can create a mimic sound of another creature, including in speech. To mimic a sound or a way of speaking, you must listen to it for at least a minute. Anytime thereafter, you can make a DC 15 charisma performance to succeed the mimicry on a success. You perform it convincingly for one hour. So you have to roll your performance check and basically get a 15 on it. And you may have advantage on that check from you impersonating them. Um, the old way was just straight better because you just mimic someone after you heard them for a minute and they'd have to insight and it had to be your deception. And you had advantage on your deception because you're a different person um, versus their insight. Now it's just a performance. And usually performance is not taken except on bards. Um, and even then it's... it's it, eh. So, technically, a downgrade. You lose your ADV on deception and you keep it on performance. Mimicry is now I said DC 15 charisma check to see if you can mimic some for only an hour. There was no limit on the other one. You could just do it forever. Uh, it's still a meh feat, and it's never taken. 
if someone is actually taking this feat and use it in the campaign, you were playing an actual bard or a musician and doing a Katy Perry concert, I guess. Um, yeah, this feat's not very good. They need to rewrite this whole fucking thing. <sighs> Actors need to be re rewritten from a whole fucking top-down perspective. You would need to give, like, advantage on deception, persuasion, and performance to perform against somebody that's a different person. And you can mimic their speech and just go back to the way it was originally. If you had those three options, deception, performance, and persuasion, to pass yourself off as a different person. And while you are a different person, you have advantage on all of those checks while you're doing it. Then this feat could actually be good. And you had the mimicry ability from 5e, but that's not. That's not what happened. So, yeah, it's not a very good feat. Tell them to rewrite it. Thirdly, so now the second fourth level feat is athlete. Athlete was not very good on 5e, in case many of you didn't understand that or didn't know. So, athlete in 5e was strength increased by 1, or your dex by 1, up to a 20. When you are prone, standing up, you only use 5 feet of movement. Climbing doesn't cost you extra movement. That was so vague, it didn't. It really didn't play a part. Um, climbing was something you had to do, and it was like half your movement. And you usually had to make an athletic check to climb a goddamn cliff side, because it's usually what you're doing. And you can make a running long jump or a running high jump after moving only 5 feet on foot rather than 10 feet. Never fucking used. Maybe there was one person in the world that's like, oh my god, I had to move 2 feet. I had this 2 square. I had 1 square only. And then I had to jump versus the 2 squares. And then my character would have died so my feet, this feet saved me. But <laughs> that was one person. And however 5e has been going on before. So now in 1 D&D... &D, it is changed to you, you increase, you had to have a prerequisite of either strength, dex, or constitution plus 13. So, pretty much everyone can get this fucking feat. Um, if your con is above a 13, which it should be, because, you know, you don't want to die, um, you can just get it. It's not repeatable, and you basically get your increase in strength, dexterity, or con. So, actual, you get constitution now, if you wanted to use that one. You get a climbing speed equal to your speed. This is vital. You just straight up can climb now. You get a climbing speed equal to, to your speed. So if you had 30 feet of movement speed, you have 30 feet of climbing speed. No check required. You can just climb up a fucking rock wall. I cannot tell you how much of an improvement that is to this feat. Okay. There's another one. Hop up. You, when you're prone, you have the you can write yourself with only five feet of movement. Same as before. Um, instead of using half your movement. It not only uses five feet. If you're continuously getting shield bashed, this could be useful, but it's not really. And lastly, jumping. You have advantage on any ability check that is that makes... You have advantage on any ability check you make for the jump action. I don't think I've ever fucking... I've jumped once or twice. So that shows you how much jumping is used. So, over to the, to the changes. Massive upgrade. Um, you get a climbing speed. That's fucking massive. Hop up can be useful. Jumping might be useful, but still probably fucking is not useful. Um, so, this feat is a massive increase. I would rank it actually somewhere near um, top tier. I wouldn't say it's like one of the best four level feats. I'd just say it's somewhere up in the tens, maybe number ten actually. Because you just straight gain, gain a climbing speed. Literally, half of your problems are just because you can't climb to a roof on a roof. Now you can just climb up a fucking wall and not have to do any of the grappling hook checks and all of that. You just straight climb. Um, so that's massive improvement on that side. So athlete, actually pretty good feet now. Charger. I think I got one. Oh, well. Charger. You basically, this is a uh, fourth level feat. The old one for 5e was when you use a dash action, you can use a bonus action to make one melee attack or shove a creature. You, if you have, if you move at least ten feet in a straight line immediately before taking this bonus action, you either gain a plus five to the damage roll if you choose to make a melee attack and hit, or push the f target five feet away if you choose a shove action. Okay, so you had to take the dash action on a fighter, more than likely, and then your bonus action to make one attack or shove someone, and then you gain plus five damage to that roll or push them ten feet away from you again. It wasn't very fucking good. Um. Because remember, you had to use your action. It doesn't say bonus action, it says action. If you did somehow pit us up with a rogue that had the ability to dash as a bonus action and your DM allowed it, 
this feat could be useful in a fighter if you did a rogue fighter combo, but that's not how it's written. Um, so in one D&D, they changed it. Um, it is prerequisite proficiency with any martial weapon. Literally every class gets martial weapons except, like, fucking wizard, I think. And we don't even know. We don't even fucking know. Um, you have trained to chain, charge headlong into battling in the following benefits. You gain an ASI and strength or dex. Good. Improved dash. We take the dash action, your speed increases by 10 feet for that action. So, that's actually useful because dash no longer doubles your speed. It just, it's just you get your, um, it no longer double doubles your speed. So you can't like dash dash. It's just your movement again. That's all it is. It's just you get to move again. Um, your movement speed again. So for example, if you had 40 feet of movement and you took the dash action, you can move another 40 feet. There is no doubling. With this, if you have 30 feet of movement, you can now have 40 feet of movement if you took the dash action. Um, so if you move 30 feet, take the dash action, and then you can move 40 feet, so 70 feet in total. So yeah, dashing has been nerfed into the ground, but hey, I mean, I guess that's what was needed. Charge attack. If you move at least 10 feet in a straight line before immediately hitting with an attack as part of the attack action you gain on your turn, you can choose one of the following effects. Gain a 1d8 bonus to the attack roll, or push a target 10 feet, provided that the target is no, it, you want to push it no more than one size larger than you. You can use this benefit only once on each of your turns. So, let's go over this. It technically got an upgrade. You get an ASI out of it. You lose your plus 5 damage, and set it now as a 1d8. You don't have to use a bonus action anymore to attack, because you just can't have it. And you gain plus 10 movement speed when dashing. And you can push a target away if you hit them. Yeah, this feat's not very fucking good. Um, for a fourth level feat that you do only have like two, um, or three, if you're lucky, um, that you'll ever get in a campaign. Maybe if you're a fighter, you get three or four. Um, this is not it. It's, it's still trash. If I was going to rewrite this, it would have to be, you, you would have to, if you move within 10, 10 feet up into a line and you hit somebody with your attack action, you gain an additional attack. That would actually make Charger at least half fucking worth it. Because getting an additional attack for charging at somebody 10 feet away would be good. But that's not what we have here. So, Charger, meh. Oh, fuck. Here we go, boys. Crossbow Expert. So, Crossbow Expert in 5e was one of those feats you had to take if you wanted to do some exploity bullshit. Basically, if you wanted to cast a ranged spell cantrip in melee, you'd have to take Crossbow Expert in 5e. And the reason is basically because of the following. Um, you being within five feet of a hostile creature doesn't impose a disadvantage on your range attack rolls, and that was meant to be spell attacks too, so blah, 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 blah. Let me just read the 5e one. You ignore the loading property of crossbows, with which you're proficient. Being within five feet of a hostile creature doesn't impose this disadvantage on your range attack rolls. When you use the attack action and attack with one-handed weapon, you can use your bonus action to attack with a hand crossbow you were holding. Now, that was how it was originally written. It has been rewritten to be the following. Prerequisite, proficiency with any martial weapon. Okay? Repeatable? No. You get an ASI out of this in your decks. Not only your decks, so that's actually not that good. You ignore the loading property of crossbows like you did before. Firing in melee, being within 5 feet of main, doesn't pose this advantage on your attack rolls with crossbows. They, they specify with crossbows now. Dual wielding. When you make the extra attack of a light weapon property, you add your ability modifier to the damage of the extra attack that is the attack with the crossbow that has the light property okay now let's shift over to here it's a massive upgrade you get a plus one asi they fixed the old exploit with the old crossbow expert which was good and they just need to fix the fucking exploit bonus action no longer required to shoot the crossbow okay in 5e this is how it originally worked with the crossbow you had two attacks plus your bonus action to fire with one crossbow um so basically you shot once um, so three in total. One D and D, you're going to attack with the attack action twice, because the crossbow is a light weapon. Um, <laughs> you are able to shoot it for free. It's a little weird. So I'll read it again. When you make the extra attack of the ex light weapon property, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the extra attack if that attack is with the crossbow that has the light property. So, technically, what has to happen here, at least in the way okay, I have written it, I could be wrong here, you have to have a light weapon in one hand and a crossbow in the other. A crossbow with a light property in the other hand, by the way. 
You are going to stab with your right hand twice for two attacks as an attack action. As part of that same action, because you have a light crossbow in your left hand, you will then be able to shoot it for a third attack, and you don't have to use a bonus action to do this. It's just all a part of the same thing. But there has to be light and light for this to work. So, I would say it's a massive upgrade just because you get the, the, the ASI out of it. Um, whether they rewrite how light weapons work, because right now it's going to get really ridiculous when we get to dual wielding, the actual feet dual wielding, um, is yet to be determined. So we're going to talk about that there, but just know that you technically get three attacks either way you do this. So, Gospel Expert, massive upgrade, I like it. And speaking of the devil, Defensive Duelist. In the old 5e, your prerequisite was to have a dex of 13 or higher. When you're wielding a finesse weapon with which you're proficient, you can hit another creature with... And another creature hits you with a melee attack, you can use your reaction to add your proficiency bonus to the AC for that attack potentially causing the attack to miss you. In 1 D&D, it's prerequisite of 13 decks or higher. Repeatable, no. Same, basically, as 5e. You get an ASI out of it, so already a massive upgrade in your decks. And parry. When you're holding a finesse weapon and another creature hits you with a melee attack, you can, as you can use your reaction to add a proficiency bonus to your armor class for that attack, potentially causing it to miss. It's literally the same. Except you can ASI out of it. So, upgraded already. Um... If you have nothing else to do with your bonus action, or reaction, sorry, it was good for one attack. If you were getting hit with, like, ten attacks, it really didn't matter. Um, it depends on your DM, depends what your character build is. It was useful sometimes, and sometimes it wasn't useful. It's still middle of the road, but at least it got ASI out of it, so it's a bit better. Dual Wielder, okay? Now... Dual wielder in 5e was basically you mastered two weapon fighting. You gain a plus one AC while you are wielding separate melee weapons in each hand, which was good. You can use your two weapon fighting even if even if one even if it is blah, blah, blah. you can use two weapon fighting even when the one handed melee weapon you are wielding isn't light aren't light. And then you can stow and draw as normally, and nobody fucking even bothered to care about that. Basically, the big thing here was dual wielder feet was required if you actually want to dual wield. You could dual wield two rapiers because they were not light. Okay? They were not light, but you could dual wield them because of the dual wielder feet. In f in one D and D they've changed it to basically you had to have a martial uh, proficiency in weapons to take it as a prerequisite. You cannot repeat it. You gain an ASI out of it, so plus one near dex or strength. Enhanced dual wielding. When you are holding a weapon with a light property in one hand, you can treat a non light weapon in your other hand. So let's say you have a Light weapon, you can treat a non-light weapon in your other hand as if it had the light property provided that the weapon lacks a two-handed property. So, you can no longer dual wield rapiers. You must, <laughs> you must have a uh, rapier in your right hand and basically a dagger in your left. And you, that's basically, the, that's how it's written. In quick draw, you can draw normally. Okay, so let's talk about this. Your technical downgrade. You lose your plus one AC. You lose the ability for two rapiers. You gain an ASI out of it. You can only have one non-light weapon in the hand. And it's still a max of three attacks. So instead of attacking... So instead of you being a fighter and attacking twice with your right hand and a bonus action attacking once with your left hand, now, it just says the attack action in one D&D is you attack twice with your um, attack action with your right hand, and then you just get a free attack with your light weapon in, in your left hand, and you keep bonus action. That's just how it is. Um, it's technically downgraded. It does make more sense, though, historically. But that's such a niche thing. Like, okay, my channel, this D&D, is like, hey, I want D&D &D to be more historical. That's what this channel is kind of centered around. Um, but I don't know why D&D is like that. Because in reality, you're not able to... Nobody wielded two rapiers, really. It was very fucking hard to do so, okay? Your hand-eye coordination is not there on humans. You need better hand-eye coordination for that to work. You need, like, fucking superhuman shit to do that, okay? But what you could do, and what was historically done, was we had a rapier in your right hand, because everyone was right-handed back then, and left-handed people were witches, and you had a dagger in your left, okay? Because it is a shorter blade, it is easy to manipulate, okay? Or a short sword, or a rapier, and then, like, a little bit longer than a dagger. That can't actually work in real life, because it's not that complex for your hand-eye coordination. Two rapiers is a bit... Actually, two rapiers is just too much. 
Um, and there's a whole bunch of other fucking reasons that I'm not a medieval weapon master. Skull the Gladiatoria can tell you more about that, and then the Metatron can also tell you more about that. But just know that <laughs> technically they made it more historically accurate, but less actually usable as a feat. So technical downgrade in my opinion. Um, so yeah, that's the wielder. Durable. Durable, fourth level feat. Constitution, prerequisite, is, uh, is a new feat. So your con is plus 13 to take it. So basically everyone. That's not repeatable. You gain ASI in your con. So congratulations. You have death, defy death. You have advantage on death saving throws. Speedy recovery. This is the big bit. As a bonus action, you can expend one hit die, roll that die, and regain a number of hit points equal to the roll. Now, this is a half decent feat if you don't like to die ever if you just take this feat, you just don't die it's great um as a bonus action you can heal yourself in combat and it, this is broken this is just straight fucking broken um it's basically dwarven fortitude in 5e but now for everyone for all races can have it so let's just think about this you get an asi you have advantage on death saving throws so you will always not basically die unless you roll like actual trash all the time um you have advantage so you have you have good chance at not dying and speedy recovery basically means that as a bonus action on every single turn, because bonus actions no longer equal attacks, as a bonus action on a fighter or barbarian, every single turn you can pop a hit dice and heal yourself. Yeah, this feat's a little broken. It is really, really good if they don't change it. If they do change it, which I'm pretty sure they will, it's probably going to be nerfed into the ground. But just for the fact that you, as any class, you can start healing yourself. As a bonus action is kind of insane um so yeah that's durable very good new feat i like it is it broken oh dude it's so broken but hey grappler so grappler in 5e required you to have a strength of 13 or higher now um in 5e you had advantage on attack rolls against a creature you were grappling you can use your action to try to pin a creature grappled by you to do so make another grapple check you succeed you are both restrained until the grapple ends Basically, the only reason you took this feat was you took it with Tavern Brawler, so you could, as a bonus action, you could try to grapple someone. As you grapple someone, you then hit them all the time with advantage. That was the whole reason you took this feat. Um, the restraining part is stupid. It, it's like if you go up to someone, you grapple them, and then you literally don't want them to move, and you don't want to move, and then you basically immobilize both of yourselves. It was so highly situational that it was never taken like that. Like, you would have to fight only one person, grapple them, and then restrain them, and just keep them down, so... It's not really used. In one D&D, it got a massive upgrade. <sighs> Already, because you can just grapple somebody as an unarmed strike, but we'll get to that. So, prerequisites with a strength or dex plus 13 is not repeatable. You gain ASI out of it. It goes to your dex or your um, strength. You have advantage on attack rolls against a creature grappled by you. Additionally, you aren't slowed when a creature, when you move a creature grappled by you, provided the creature is your size or smaller. So if you grapple another human being, you can move your movement speed in any direction um, and not take the difficult terrain or half movement speed. You just go. Um, have punch and grab, and this is important. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike as part of the attack action on your turn, you can deal damage to the target and also grapple it. You can use this benefit only once per turn. So this is just modifying what you can do with an unarmed strike. With an unarmed strike, usually it was punch, if you hit, you choose the three options. One of them could be grapple, and you grapple them. Okay. With this, you if you make an unarmed strike as part of that same action, okay, as part of that same attack action, um, you deal damage, and you grapple them. That's the only change there. So, and you can only do it once per turn. So overall, got a massive upgrade. R grappling rigor can one D and D, so unarmed strikes can grapple. <coughs> it's yeah, it's good. Uh, then you have advantage on all your attack rolls for days. And you can move them behind your line and just continuously kill them. So let's just say you went up to someone and he was somewhere in their front line. You grab him, pull him back behind your line and beat the crap out of him and then do it again and again and again. Um, you also gain a plus one ASI and you're not slowed when moving a grapple creature. So as I just explained, this feat is really good now. One of the top tier feats if you're playing a melee build at all. If you're playing a melee build at all, you want to take this feat. Just for the fact that you can hit somebody, grapple them, pull them back, grab your sword out as a free action, I'm assuming, and then kill them um, with advantage the entire time. So yeah, 
Very, very, very good. Great weapon master. Oh, my boy. They shot my boy. They shot our boy. They killed him. They, they destroyed him. Great weapon master has been nerfed into the ground, and I'm not happy about it. I'll get into why it's a stupid thing they did this, okay? In 5e, once per turn, when you score a critical hit with a melee weapon or reduce a creature HP to zero with one, you can make one melee attack as a bonus action. I have never done this because I have forgotten in the middle of combat. Because remember, if I get a critical hit, I just I forget about it. I just do the fucking damage. Uh, if you somehow sprat, or if you somehow keep track and can use this, it's still good. It's just I just don't remember it, and most people don't fucking remember it. Actually, all my friends just don't remember this thing. If you had Polar Master in 5e, which I did, and I used my bonus action every single time to do more damage at the start of the turn, I would hit them with the bonus action and then attack, you know, um, I would just forget. Even if I did, I don't have a bonus action, so, again, meh. It's good, it's just you, you will forget about it. However, in 5e, before you make a melee attack with a heavy weapon that you're, that you're proficient with, you can choose to take a negative 5... To the attack roll, if the attack hits, you add plus 10 attack damage. This was absolutely vital on every melee build. Every melee build required you to take what Great Weapon Master just for the simple fact for the 10 damage. It, the reason is because you will start getting insane levels of gear and being able to hit things. You will easily get over plus 15 to hit um, when you start playing at level 16, 17. And even before then, if you have a level 12, 13 to hit with a melee weapon, a negative 5 is not that bad. Um, and you add plus 10 damage. This was basically required for you to be up up to the tier levels of mages um, when you, you were doing damage. And it made you great in killing single targets very fast and letting the mages kill their groups of enemies. Um, but they shot my boy. I'm sad. They shot him. So in one d d you have to be proficient in a melee weapon. It's not repeatable. You had an ASI in your strength. So, not dex, just strength. Cleave. Immediately when you score a critical hit with a melee weapon, you reduce it or reduce a creature to zero. You can make a make a attack with the same weapon as a bonus action. Same as before. Although, this is the massive change right here. When you hit a creature with a heavy weapon as part of the attack action on your turn, you can cause the damage, the weapon to deal extra damage to the target. The equal, the damage, extra damage equals your proficiency bonus, and you can only do it once per turn. So, being very generous here and saying you get to like level 11 or 10 and your proficiency bonus is 4. You take this feat, you hit someone, and you deal 4 extra damage for one of your attacks. That's terrible. Great Weapon Master allowed you basically if you wanted to and you could hit with both attacks for 20 damage. And if you were a level 11 fighter, you got 3 attacks. And Polar Master, you got four attacks. And if you somehow hit with all those attacks, which you wouldn't, but let's just say, hypothetically say you would, that would be plus 40 damage on all of those attacks against a single target. Now it's just four damage. You can see that this is a massive penalty. Um, so again, massive downgrade. You gain an ASI out of it. That's not worth it. You lose a minus five roll penalty to gain plus 10 damage. Instead, you just deal damage equal to your off once per turn. Um, not round, so turn. Technically, if you hit somebody on a reaction on some on another creature's turn, you get it again. So maybe it would be around. But you lose the option. That's why I don't like this. You lose the option of taking a negative five penalty to gain ten damage on every single attack. Again, taking that negative five penalty is minus twenty five percent chance to hit. Okay, um, especially if they have high AC like eighteen, you could very well miss because you took that option, and it, you just lose player agency. Like I don't understand why they would take this out if they added this this has to be added as a as a, just a game rule okay like an additional game rule just critical i don't fucking know critical um strike or like uh aim strike gutted strike um precision strike i would just call it precision precision strike and every single character in DD can do it you take a negative five roll for 10 damage on any weapon attack um and you probably won't hit most of the time unless you're fighting like a low level enemy that has a dog shit AC like 10 or 12 um, and you're really high level then yeah you would hit all the time and give it 40 damage most of the time you wouldn't fucking hit and when you hit it really did matter that you actually killed it so that is what I do in my games 
Um, I just, this is an ability everyone can do. Um, because taking a feat for it is just stupid. And they got rid of it, so... This feat is just trash now. I, I wouldn't take it. I literally see no reason to take this feat. There are so many better options now. Um, and doing four extra damage per turn on one attack is trash. Um, and you can only do it once. So, yeah. Great, great master. My boy has been shot. He was taken out back and shot. So, I would advise you in all of your D&D games to add the negative five roll and gain plus ten damage on every single melee attack and just add it to a, 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 your homebrew rule. That's what I do. And just give it to every character. If they want to use it, it's there. If you want to use it as your D as a DM and use it on your monsters, it's also there for you. So, there you go. Heavily armored. Now, this feat was fucking trash in 5e. It is still trash. In 5e, you had to be prerequisite was you had to be proficient in medium armor. You got one strength and you gained proficiency in heavy armor. In one D&D, you have to have medium armor training, which means you have the proficiency in it. You gain an ability score increase of con or strength, one. And you gain heavy armor training. Basically, you can wear heavy armor now. ASI can go to Connor Strength now, and it's still a terrible feat. I just wouldn't fucking take it. If you were trying to get a character to wear heavy armor for some inexplicable reason, you need to start with a fighter or somebody that can wear heavy armor and then multi-class into the thing you're going to take. That is what I would do. I wouldn't. This is a fourth level feat. I would never take this. I would just build a different build to take a multi-class in something else. It is terrible. And it remains terrible. Um... I don't. I won't even say you should get rid of this feat because there might be such a niche to fucking do this. But this feat needs like a massive overhaul. Um, I think it should just be combined with the next feat we're going to talk about because it's just trash. It should just be combined with the next feat we're talking about. So let's get to it. Heavy armor master. Um, heavily armored should just be heavy armor master incorporated into it, and you would solve the fucking problem of having these two feats. Just have one, and it would be better for everyone. <sighs> Prerequisite in five e was proficiency in heavy armor. Um, in 5e, you had to increase your strength by 1 to a max of 20. While you're wearing heavy armor, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage that you take from non-magical attacks was reduced by 3. This is important. In 1 D&D, heavy armor master, the prerequisites are basically you have to have heavy armor proficiency. You gain a ASI in con or strength by 1. And damage reduction when you are hit by an attack while wearing heavy armor. Pier bludgeoning, any bludgeoning piercing, slashing damage dealt to you by that attack is reduced by an amount equal to your proficiency bonus. There is no limit here, and it does not say magical. It does not say non-magical. What does this mean? First of all, it's a massive upgrade, okay? Damage reduction includes non-magical unless otherwise specified. Uh, basically, unless otherwise specified in a new fucking rule set they're coming out with. But basically, <laughs> you get... Um, damage reduction equals your proficiency for every single attack, including magical weapons now, which was a downfall of heavy armor that didn't have magical weapons um, or magic reduction. Now you do! Great. Damage is also reduced by your prof instead of plus of three. So at high tiers of play, you get six proficiency. Um, every single attack is minus six to you directed to you with a claw or weapon. So if you take three attacks and they all hit you, you will reduce the damage by 18. <laughs> Think about that. You will reduce the damage by 18. Some attacks at low levels may just not kill you. Um, may just literally do no damage. If they roll like two damage and you just don't eat any two damage because your your um, your armor takes it. Now, this is a good change overall. However, I'm kind of worried this is, might be a little too much. So, in my games... For homebrew, I run you know more realistic realistic D and D. If you haven't caught on to that, um, but basically I give armor, so heavy armor, each one. So like I think it's chainmail, splint, and then plate. I could be missing one, but the, the other one doesn't fucking matter because nobody uses it. Um, each one of those levels gives you a damage reduction of up to three. So plate gives you negative three damage, and then plus one, plus two, and plus three plate give you an additional negative damage modifier. So plus one plate gets you negative four. Plus two plate gets you negative five, and plus three plate gets you negative six. Okay? And this works on magical weapons. Okay? And it's piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing. And it works on magical weapons. In my homebrew. Okay? This is what my homebrew is, except it's better, and it's on every armor class, and it goes up to negative six by itself. 
So yeah, this feat is really fucking good. If you pair this with a paladin in one D and D, you're just gonna be unfucking killable. Literally unkillable. You you take reduced damage from every attack, and and you can heal yourself and you cast spells. So paladins, if they don't nerf them into the ground, which they probably are, would benefit enormously from this. Any tank would benefit enormously from this. Any fighter would benefit from this feat. If you are a fighter and you can wear heavy armor and you are going to wear heavy armor, you take this damn feat. It is your number one pick. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. It's just massive fucking upgrade over 5e. And yeah, it's very good. Um, I don't know if I would change it. It's just good. It's just really, really good. So, yeah. <sighs> Inspiring leader. Prerequisites. So it wasn't 5e. Prerequisites in 5e. 13 charisma or higher. You spend 10 minutes inspiring your companions, storing up their resolve, shoring up their resolve to fight. When you do so, choose up to six creatures, which can include yourself. Within 30 feet of you who can see or hear you and understand you, each creature can gain temporary hit points equal to your level plus your charisma modifier. So at maximum, if you are level 20 and you had 20 charisma, so you would get 25 HP per creature. Um, a creature can't gain temporary hit points from this feat again until you finish a short or long rest. So... At max level, 20, 20 level bard, you get, and you give six people this. 20th level bard gives six people 25 temporary HP, which can include yourself at max level. It was a decent feat. Um, I don't know if I took it ever. It It's not just because it wasn't a good feat. It is a good feat back in, but in 5e, it is still it is a good feat. Um, it's just I didn't play a bard that much. So, or I played bard early and never got to the high level stuff. Now in 1 D&D, it requires you to have a Wisdom or Charisma plus 13. It's not repeatable. You get an ASI out of it, so it's already an upgraded feat. Sh encouraging performance. At the end of a short or long rest, you can give an inspiring performance, a speech or song of, or dance. When you use up to six creatures, including yourself, within 30 feet of you, who witness the performance, um, then choose creatures. Each gain temporary hit points up to 2d4 plus your proficiency bonus. So technically if we're speaking it would be a downgrade but it's an asi improvement so it's an upgrade it's just straight an upgrade for an asi improvement unless you got to level 20 bard for 20 plus 5 temporary hp for everyone this is not going to happen now at a maximum it can be 8 plus 5 so 13 i would so this feat is better for yourself and worse for your party overall than it is in 5e um but you get an ace out of it. So I think it is properly balanced for you getting an ASI. That's what I will say. It is worse from a game perspective for everyone else. But for you, it's just better because of an ASI. So as a balance change, I think I'd stick with this. Um, yeah, I, I just stick with this because you just get an ASI out of it. So there you go. Keen Mind. Oh, boy. Keen Mind was such dog shit in 5e that either DMs banned it. Nobody fucking used it, which was me. Or it's just not allowed. It, it was so terrible. So let's read the terrible um, thing in 5e. Your intelligence increases by 1 to max to 20. Woo. You always know which way is north. You always know the number of hours left before the next sunrise or sunset. You can accurately recall anything you have seen or heard within the past month. Now, that part right there, DMs would fucking throw a book at you. Because most of the time... Um, if the DMs don't run long campaigns where they don't use the variant rules for long rest that take a week and short rest that take three days or whatever, um, it would, it would just be like a month would actually be a whole campaign. And you could literally just look at your DM and say, tell me, tell me what I saw. And that's why it was basically banned. Um, so on one D&D, they have tried to improve it. You have a prerequisite of, you had to basically get a prerequisite, so now you didn't have to have a prerequisite. You didn't have it before, but now you do. You have intelligence plus 13, or 13 plus. Repeatable, no. You get an intelligence score out of it, so you get an ASI out of it. Lore knowledge. Choose one of the following skills Arcana, History, Investigation, Nature, or Religion. If you lack proficiency in the chosen skill, you gain proficiency in it. And if you are proficient in it, you gain expertise in it. That is massive. That is massive. You get expertise out of this skill now. And quick study. You can take the study action as a bonus action. Okay. There's many things you can go look at the one D&D &D thing. 
study action is basically you take the fucking investigation action and you look around the goddamn room and you can see anything. Now you can take his bonus action. So if you're getting stabbed in the face while you're trying to like read a book, I, you can do his bonus action or you could try to find a, a silvery goblet of fire while getting attacked. That's not very good, but the lore knowledge, the proficiency is not very good. You get one proficiency. That's not very good. The one expertise is very good. So massive upgrade turns a useless feat into a bad one. It's not a very good feat. It's just still bad. But hey, it's a massive upgrade. You gain proficiency in, you gain prof, or more importantly, expertise in one skill. So if you've got expertise in one skill, and it's investigation, and you're a wizard, you're pretty good at finding everything investigation-wise. Quick study is actually useless. Literally just the ability to make an INT check as a bonus action. Very niche. Very niche. Usually you finish the combat and then do investigating. I... I have never tried to be like, ah, yes, I will investigate why I'm being stabbed in the face. So rarely does that come up. I would not take a feat over it. Um, but hey, it's a massive upgrade over Keen Mind. Still dog shit feat, but it is a massive upgrade. Mage Slayer. So, Mage Slayer in 5e was fucking trash in my opinion, but let's read it. When a creature within 5 feet of you casts a spell, you can use your reaction to make a melee attack against that creature when you damage a creature that is concentrating on a spell the creature has disadvantage on saving throws it makes to maintain a concentration you have advantage on saving throws against spells or cast by a creature within five feet of you this was so fucking niche um when a creature within five feet of you casts a spell you can use your reaction to make a melee attack against that creature you, you have to literally be next to a demi lich for this to work or a spell caster fun fact dms don't like usually throwing spell casters at parties because they can fucking tpk them but that's a whole separate issue um, so Mage Slayer was not very good in 5e. In one d d you had to have proficiency in a martial weapon. You didn't before in 5e. It's not repeatable. You get an ASI out of it, so you get strength of dex. Concentration Breaker. When you damage a creature that is concentrating, it has this advantage on saving throws to make, to maintain concentration. <laughs> I mean, if you... The thing is, this is better than what it was in 5e. It's a massive upgrade, Okay. You just basically have to throw a dagger at someone, which can be very beneficial if someone in the party takes this feat. And just someone takes this feat. Doesn't matter who takes the feat. Someone takes the feat. They throw a dagger with their plus, like, I don't know, like 18 a hit or something, or more likely probably plus 13 a hit. You hit the damn person. You do like two damage. Okay? Doesn't matter the damage. You do two damage. Concentration breaker. When you damage a target, it has disadvantage on saving throws it makes to maintain its concentration. So it has to roll a save, it has disadvantage. Now you get someone that can actually hit the thing with a lot of damage. It already has this advantage because you hit him with your plus two, with your two damage of a dagger or something. Then you can uh, break his concentration or whatever. So I can see this being very useful in like a ranger because you can snipe someone with a longbow from 600 feet away if you took a sharpshooter. Prick the dude. And then he has this advantage on his saving throws to maintain his concentration. And someone hits him for a lot of damage and he loses concentration. That is so niche. Unless you're fighting a lot of spellcasters, I yeah. And also, guard in mind, if you fail an intelligence, an intelligence, wisdom, or courage of saving throw, you can cause yourself to succeed instead. Once you use this benefit, you cannot use it again until you finish a long rest. <coughs> that is broken. So, this feat got a massive change in overall massive upgrade. Plus one ASI. Guaranteed success on it. intelligence, wisdom, or charisma is broken. You already have current concentration breaker, which is already good on a row on a ranger that can prick somebody and help in a massive. You have to be planning this out, but it, it does work. That's actually a really good benefit. Okay, better than what it was in five E. And you can just straight up flip the DM off and just succeed on whatever. So let's just say, let's just say you got targeted by a lich and the save was like twenty five intelligence save, and you rolled a two. You can succeed. And it's, it's for the DM, I'll be like, I succeed. What happens? I succeed. DM, I succeed. Um, yeah, that can save your ass. That can save a whole party from a TPK. That can save it. Massive upgrade. I would take this if you are in a party that likes to game the fuck out of 5e. And someone in the party takes this. It's a good... I would say it's a medium to good feat. I would say good just because you can succeed on a... Guaranteed succeed on one of those checks. Um, one of saving throws. And you get it back every long rest, so yeah, it's very good. If you like the game, and someone in your party has this, preferably a ranged character, it would be very good for fighting spellcasters. 
Um, and even just Guarded Mind is great for you just not eating like a game-ending spell for your character. So, yeah. Mage Slayer, massive upgrade. I would take it in a party that likes the game, metagame, and game a lot. <sighs> Medium Armor Master. Oh, boy. So, Medium Armor Master in 5e. Okay. Situationally useful. You get to take a bard and you have to... Mm -hmm. Let us read it. Proficiency medium armor is required. While wearing medium armor, while medium armor, while you're wearing medium armor, oh my god, um, it doesn't pose disadvantage on your stealth dexterity checks. Because usually it did. If you wear half plate, it has disadvantage on uh, dexterity stealth checks. When you wear medium armor, you can add three rather than two to your AC if you have a dex of 16 or higher. In one D&D, you basically have to have medium armor again, proficiency. You add an ASI, so whatever, strength or dex. And while wearing the armor, you gain medium armor is you add a three instead of a two. Do you see if you have a dex of 16 or higher? You lose the ability to have stealth on half plates and other armors. That is fucking trash can. It is upgraded simply for the fact that you get an ASI out of it now instead of nothing. If I were to change this feat in one way, that would actually make this a half decent feat. Again, it's not, a, it was never a amazing feat. It was, you had to be, you had to be playing a character in which you were going to wear medium armor you were going to have a dex of 16 and no higher, 16 dex only, and you were going to pick this feat up to get um, 19 AC out of your armor instead of 18. And if you had a shield, you could get it to 21. It was so hyper niche, I did it on like a Valor Bard um, once or twice. It's It was hyper niche back then, and it's still hyper niche now. And they reduced, they got rid of the disadvantage on stealth, which was the whole fucking reason you really did take this feat, was just so you could stealth as a um, person in medium armor. They should add that thing back into medium armor master for one D&D, &D, and we're all good. Then this feat becomes niche. It becomes normal to good on a niche scale, is what I would say, if they add the, it doesn't impose disadvantage on your stealth checks back in. But right now, it actually is downgraded. Um, as an overall feat, but the ASI, you know, balances it out. So, there you go. Mounted Combatant. Okay, this is going to take a while to explain. So, 5e, you had advantage on melee attack rolls against any unmounted creature that is smaller than your mount. So, if you're wearing a horse, it's a large, and you had advantage against anything that wasn't large. You can force an attack, target at your mount to attack you instead. There was no limit on this, so you could literally eat all the damage instead of your mount. If your mount is subject to an effect that allows it to make a dexterity saving throw to only take half damage, and instead takes no damage if it succeeds on the throw, otherwise it takes half. Basically, you had um, evasion from the rogue on your mount. In one D&D, &D, um, again, 5e had no no prerequisites. In one D&D, &D, you have to have a martial weapon proficiency. You get, an a you get an ASI out of this. You get strength, dex, or wisdom by one. Mount handler. You have advantage on wisdom checks, animal handling, made to handle or train horses and other beasts employed as mounts. Straight up an upgrade. Half the damn time, you are not actually fighting on your mount. You are trying to fight your mount to go somewhere. If, you're DMD, DM, if your DM's a dick, that's what will happen. Fun fact, I've, I've had to go through that. So having advantage on those checks is very helpful. Um, while mounted, you have advantage on have advantage on attack rolls against any creature that is within five feet of your mount and at least one size smaller than it. This is not written very well because a lance has 10 feet of reach. And it says while mounted, advantage on attack rolls against any creature that is within five feet of your mount. It should say within weapons reach of you while mounted. Again, let me repeat that. It should be rewritten to be Advantage on all attack rolls against any creature that is within weapon's reach while you are mounted and at least one size smaller than it. Than it. That's how it should be written, but it's not. So your lance, fun fact, is going to be dog shit because you can't actually hit him and then run away. That's not how that works. You're going to have to be five feet, hit him, and then take his A off, which is stupid. So hopefully they fix that. I'll fix it myself if they don't. Um... Leap aside, if your mount is subjected to an effect that allows it to make a dexterity saving throw to take only half damage, it, looks, it takes no damage if it succeeds on the saving throw, and only half damage if it fails for your mount to gain its benefit, you must be riding it, and neither of you can be incapacitated. You have evasion. <coughs> you have evasion from 5e, from the rogue. Veer. 
While mounted, you can use your reaction to force an attack that hits your mount to hit you instead. This is a downgrade from basically um, your mount. You can force an attack to hit you instead of your mount all the time. Now it's just a reaction. So technically, this makes targeting a mount much easier. Um, if you ever did this in D&D, which, fun fact, I have I, I once fought mounted. Twice, maybe. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not amazing. So that's a downgrade. So let's go over to the left side. Massive upgrade. Straight up is massive upgrade because you have advantage on wisdom checks and you have an ASI. You have an ASI increase. You have advantage on animal handling checks for your mount. You have advantage against a creature one size smaller than your mount. You have evasion for your mount and you can force an attack. Their attack is reaction rather than your mount. This is good to amazing depending on your campaign. It can be great and it can be dog shit. It could literally be useless in your campaign or it could be the best goddamn thing you've ever had. Depends on your DM. If you are running a campaign in which you are mounted, it goes to good to great. If you are running a campaign in which you are never on a mount, it's immediately useless because what the fuck are you going to do with it? I would recommend, if you are going to use this feat, I would recommend, and useful in like most common situations, which is what my friend does, you need to play a gnome, a goblin, a creature that is small, that is able to ride a wolf or something of medium size, that can go literally everywhere and you have a pole arm, or in this case it doesn't fucking matter because you're just going to get hit anyway, um, a great sword and just go in there and hit them with advantage because you're on a mount that's technically a medium so you have advantage on all medium creatures. That's how I would run it um, if I were you. Otherwise, you would need to have a massive setup where you're fighting all the time mounted. Or your DM can be nice to you like I am and just give this to players for free um, if they ever get mounts because it's, it's so niche that you're going to have mounted combat that you're going to be fighting mounted. It's I wouldn't say D&D is not designed for it. You could do it. It's just harder, a lot harder to do. So yeah, there you go. Massive upgrade overall. Um, I told you how to use it. You know, small creature. You have to be a small creature on a medium mount. Have advantage all the time. It's great. Um, and if you're a DM out there, just give this to your fucking players if <coughs> they ever get a mount because taking this feat is... <coughs> taking this feat is good, but... The amount of times they're going to be actually finding mounted is probably like zero. So. Observant. Ooh, this one was a good feat back in the day. So 5e, increase your intelligence score by one or your wisdom by one. You can see a creature's mouth while just speaking a language you understand. It can interpret what it is saying by reading its lips. Basically, you could read someone's lips. I think I used this one time. I've seen someone use this one time to good effect. Now, you have a plus five. So your passive perception, wisdom perception, and passive intelligence scores. The passive intelligence was not fucking used at all. Okay, I've never seen someone use it, really ever. I've used it a couple of times. The wisdom perception passive plus five is very key. If you have like eighteen perception and you had like plus five um, to your perception score, you have plus five wisdom. And you gave your proficiency, you know, and you had a plus three proficiency in uh, perception that gave you eight. So 18 passive perception. Getting another five on top of that gets you 23. It means you can see everything. Passive perception lets you see um, whoever is trying to stealth around you. If you can beat their score, you can see them. So it was very fucking handy. Now, in one d d got nerfed. Intelligence or wisdom plus 13 was required. Now, it wasn't in 5e, but now it is. You get an ASI of intelligence or wisdom plus one. You gain Keen Observer. Choose one of the following skills. Insight, Investigation, Perception. If you like a proficiency the skill, you have gained a proficiency. And if you have lack, if you have proficiency in it, you gain expertise. So, you lose your plus five for gaining expertise in one skill. I don't call that even trade. However, I can see why it is done. Because intelligence, the passive intelligence is not used at all. Okay? The creatures, reading creatures' lips, is not used at all. Okay, um, expertise in one skill is very nice because if you have expertise in per perception, even if you were running a character at level five that had plus three proficiency, you can get plus six in whatever. So plus six in perception, which would be better than your passive passive. Uh, this would be better than your passive wisdom going up by five, technically, um, for that little bit. 
However, if you somehow had expertise in perception already, the old 5e observant was just straight better because you can't actually have stupid uh, passive perception. Because you could easily get your uh, passive perception up to like 32 um, in 5e. It's not that hard. You just basically get somebody that's really good at wisdom, you give them expertise in perception, and you give them this feat, and you give them sentinel shield. Um, yeah. If you have advantage on a check, by the way, you have a plus five to it base. So if you had a sentinel shield, which gave you advantage on perception checks, and if you paired that with observant, you had a plus 10 um, to your passive perception. And then if you had a base like 22 or 20 uh, perception, you then get 30 and 32 passive perception. So literally nothing goes sneak up on you. So yeah, they nerfed it to the ground, and I see why they did that. So there you go. Um, you get expertise in this skill now. It's been downgraded. Uh, quick search is useless. You basically didn't take the search action as a bonus action. <laughs> basically, if you have to look through a bunch of cupboards to find something real quick, you can do that as a bonus action instead of an action. Or whatever. Useless unless somehow you need to do the search action in combat all the time. So, this feat was brokenly a medium feat. Like, brokenly you could make it stupid for a meme, but served really no purpose other than that. Um, and now it's just an eh kind of feat, so. Pole arm master. Oh boy. So, they nerfed the fuck out of the pole arm sentinel combo. I will tell you guys right off the bat. And we're going to get into why. So, let's, let's go. In 5e, you get the following benefits. When you take the attack action and attack with only a glaive, halberd, quarter staff, or spear, you can use a bonus action to make a melee attack with the opposite end of the weapon. This attack uses the same ability and modifies the primary attack. <coughs> and the weapon's damage die for this attack is d4 and it deals a bludgeoning damage. Okay. For this to work, you have to pull, the, pull this up with uh, Great Weapon Master. Because remember, Great Weapon Master, you take a negative 5 to your hit for plus 10 damage. So even a d4, okay, if you had max strength, so plus 5 strength, right, you still did a d4 plus 5. And you had a Great Weapon Master and you hit with this thing, you would do a d4 plus 15 damage. Which is the whole reason you took this with Sentinel. But hey. While you're wielding a Glaive, Halberd, Pike, Quarterstaff, or Spear, other creatures provoke an opportunity attack when they enter your reach and you have that weapon. Okay? They have changed this. Now I'm going to tell you why it doesn't fucking work with Sentinel. Or I may get to it later, but it just doesn't work. You have to have a first and a martial weapon, obviously. <sighs> or repeatable, no. You get an ASI out of it to your strength. Cool. Full arm strike. Immediately after you take the attack action with the weapon, you can it has a heavy property and the reach property. It has a heavy and reach property. Well, I guess they're adding both of them together. Congratulations. You make a you can use a bonus action to make a melee attack with the opposite end of the weapon. The weapon's damage die for that is D4 and it does bludgeoning damage. Yeah, same fucking thing you always had. Bonus action to do so. Reactor strike. When you're holding a weapon that has a heavy and a reach property, you can use your reaction to make one melee attack against a creature that enters your reach. Um, you have with that weapon. That is not an opportunity attack. That is just you make a melee attack. That is why it no longer works with Sentinel. It's not an opportunity attack anymore. It's just an attack. And Sentinel requires it to be an opportunity attack to do the basically zero movement speed and then you back up. Can't do that no more. So, it's gone. I don't think it was broken. Um, now, if you play D&D &D and you had like one monster, I could see it being broken. If you had a dragon and some dude just like stabbed it in the pinky toe with like his plus 18 to hit and it can't move. Yeah. If you're fighting multiple enemies, it, it only... <laughs> if you're fighting multiple enemies, and they don't even have to be good enemies. It doesn't have to be multiple enemies. It's going to be freaking kobolds if all that, all that matters. You can only do that. Hit them once. So they'd enter your reach. You'd hit them. Stop them from attacking you. And then you back up and you, you know, that's how you do it. If they have multiple enemies, you hit them. You stop one and then the other ones come around and kill you. So. Yeah, I got downgraded, sadly. Reactor Strike is not an opportunity attack. Now it it is now a regular attack. So therefore, it no longer works as Sentinel. Polearm slash Sentinel no longer works as it does in 5e. Still works. It just doesn't work as it does in 5e. And you get a plus one ASI out of it, so. I still say downgraded, but you could at least argue that it is a neutral feat now. So again, it's still a good feat if you are wielding a glaive or if you want to be polearm dude. It's still good. Don't get me wrong. It's still a good feat. It's just less good now. Resilient. Same as before. Choose one ability. This is the 5e version. You choose one ability to get the following benefits. You choose an ability score. You gain proficiency in that ability in the saving throws. And choose an ability. What is it for 1D&D? 
the exact same. You choose one of the abilities, you gain an ASI out of it, and you gain proficiency. It's the same as always before. It is always a decent choice. It, depending on your character build, it could be required of you. If you don't have proficiency in con, if you're somebody that doesn't have proficiency in con and you're a spellcaster and then you need it, resilience is taken, and then you have to take warcaster with it to not fail your saves. It's always the same, always good feet, never bad, so there you go. A ritual caster. Oh boy. This one got changed quite a bit. So, Ritual Caster in 5e required you have intelligence or wisdom of 13 or higher. You choose this feat. You acquire a book, a ritual book, holding two first level spells of your choice. Choose one of the following classes. Bard, Cleric, Druid, Sorcerer, Warlock, Wizard. You must choose your spells from that class's spell list. And the spells you choose must have the ritual tag. The spells you choose also determine your spell casting ability for these spells. Charisma for Bard, Sorcerer, Warlock, Wisdom for Cleric and Druid, blah, 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 blah. If you come across a spell in written form, such as Magical Scroll or a Wizard Spellbook, you might be able to add it to your Ritual Book. The spell must be on the spell list for your class that you chose, which is basically, you had to be a fucking wizard if you really want to do this fucking shit. Um, or Cleric. Or... <sighs> there's, a, there's a way to do this. Wizards could technically do Ritual Spells, but they had to use them in their prepared action. It was fucking a whole thing. Um, anyway... Um, you basically choose a spell from their list of that, and then the spell level can be no, no higher than half your levels rounded up, and it must have the ritual tag. The processing of copying the spell in the ritual book takes two hours per level of the spell, and cost 50 GP per spell. The copy represents material components to expand, blah, 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 to master, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this was good situationally. And what I mean by that is if you were high level, because that's the only reason you'd take this, if you're high level, and you wanted to cast ritual spells for me it's basically letting our entire party communicate um in a hive mind it's a fifth level spell you gotta do this with and took two eggs i had to keep smashing together <coughs> i took this because i was an artificer and i wasn't a wizard that's why i had to take it um in one D, &D they've changed it slightly requires you to have intelligence wisdom or charisma plus 13 you have gained the following benefits get asi now ritual spells you choose two first level spells that have the ritual tag, okay, from Arcane, Divine, or Primal spell list. Choose two, okay. You always have those two spells prepared, and you cast them with any two spell slots you have. So basically, you get two first-level spell slots that you can cast with two spell slots for free, and then you have to use spell slots after that to cast them, okay? First, first, real, real big upgrade. Um, so you get two spell slots of first level. Um, next, Quick Ritual. When it's a benefit, you can cast ritual spells you have prepared using a regular cast time, rather than the required time for a ritual. Doing so doesn't require a spell slot. Once you've cast a spell in this way, you cannot use this benefit again until you finish a long rest. What does this mean? You can cast, so usually a ritual spell takes you 10 minutes, okay? If, it, if the spell originally required you to take one action, it takes 10 minutes to cast it as a ritual. With quick ritual, you can cast it as if you had it prepared, so it only takes an action, and you can do it once per uh, long rest. And then you need to burn a spell slot to do this. You need to burn a spell slot to do it um, after that. So in theory, you get three first level spell slots for free every long rest. And then you can use, um, obviously, if those spells are prepared now, quote unquote prepared, and you can cast them again. But here's another thing. Ritual casting has been changed, kind of. If you have a spell prepared, so ritual casting in 1D&D, if you have a spell prepared that has a ritual tag, you can cast the spell as a ritual. A special feature is no longer required for casting. All other rules of the rituals uh, in 2014 player handbook still apply. That means that you no longer um, technically need to take ritual caster because everyone can cast a ritual spell. Um, it's just you have to have the spell prepared. If you have a spell prepared, it has a ritual tag, you can cast it. Um, the only thing the ritual spell gets you is basically two slots you can prepare and then a and then you can cast one of them really quickly. So, again, this is still a massive fucking upgrade over the original. You have plus one ASI. You get two uh, leveled spells from three lists. Two of those spells can be cast once each without using a spell slot. Quick Ritual gives you one immediate prepared ritual spell without using a slot. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, if the, yeah, you can basically cast Find Familiar as an action. Let's put it that way. Um, as a ritual, Quick Ritual. Or whatever you want, they really. And you can't have unlimited ritual spells in your book. That is a massive change, though. It's sad. Because there's not many ritual spells, and the ones that are are not very good, usually. 
and having a book full of all of them for situational benefit was really nice. But they got rid of that. So maybe they'll add that back. That is the one change I would add to Ritual Caster is saying you have their book back. I would say that one change I would like to see, you add the book back and you say what you have right here, which is basically if you come across a spell in written form, blah, 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 blah. Have that as an additional supplement to Ritual Caster. If you do that, this spell's very good then. Um, still situationally useful. Um, medium to very medium to good. Um, but right now, since you can't prepare an ass ton of spells, because you can't, and uh, you don't have your book, you can't actually have that many ritual spells prepared. So, yeah, there you go. The one change I would make, if you agree with me, you can write to them on the link that will be in the description for, you know, that thing if it is October 20th to fill out. Just tell them to add that into the ritual caster. Baba da boopy. <coughs> Sentinel. Oh, boy. The big old boy Sentinel. So, you have Master... This is a 5e version. You have Master Techniques, blah, blah, blah. When you hand a creature with an opportunity attack, the creature's speed becomes zero for the rest of the turn. Creatures provoke opportunity attacks from you even if they take the disengage action before they leave your reach. When a creature within five feet of you makes an attack attack against a target other than you, and that target doesn't have this feat, you can use your reaction to make a melee attack against that creature. Same as it always been, okay? In one D&D, you know how to have a proficiency in any martial weapon. You gain an ASI out of it for your strength or dex. Immediately after a creature, so this is Guardian, immediately after a creature within 5 feet of you takes a disengage action or hits another creature other than you with an attack, you can make an opportunity attack against that creature. So, you, if they hit the person next to you, you can hit him with an AOP. Halt. When a creature is hit with a, when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, a creature's speed becomes zero for the rest of the turn. So, <clears throat> you technically still have it. So, again, Sentinel, massive upgrade by itself is massive upgrade. You get half ASI out of it, so bump split an ASI. Guardian still works the same way. Speed is still zero after you hit it with an AOP. Can't use with Polar Master anymore, as a Polar Master doesn't provoke opportunity attacks when they come within reach and suddenly now use a reaction attack. Still a good feat if paired with Speedster. We'll talk about Speedster, but speed it, it's still good. Let's put it that way. It's still good with Speedster, so there you go. Um, Sentinel actually got a massive buff because of an ASI, so still the same. Sharpshooter. Oh, boy. They killed my boy. They killed my boy. All right. So, in 5e, Sharpshooter, attacking long range doesn't pose disadvantage. Okay. But that was useful. Just straight up just useful. Range attacks ignore half cover and three quarters cover. Broken. Before you attack with a ranged weapon that you're proficient with, you can take a negative five to the attack roll and hit. If you add the attack hits, you add plus 10 damage. Now, you could actually get your ability to hit with ranged attacks like range like a bow actually higher than you could melee attacks simply for the fact which we'll get into at the very end of the video um fighting styles you can take a fighting style that gets you plus two on all range attacks okay so you could have a higher ranged attacks than you could versus melee attacks for some fucking stupid reason but i, I fix that on my homebrew rules for some reason i'll get to that when i get there but yeah but you lose um in one dnd they change it prerequisite proficiency in any martial weapon obviously repeatable no you get an ASI out of it to your dex. So, good. Uh, bypass cover. You ignore cover. <coughs> Need I say more? Firing in melee. Between being within five feet of enemy doesn't impose this advantage on your range attack rolls of the weapon. So you no longer have to take a sharpshooter and crossbow expert. You can just take a sharpshooter. I actually like that change. Long range, attacking at long range doesn't impose this advantage on your range attack rolls of the weapon. Same as sharpshooter. Okay? It's a downgrade. A straight downgrade. Plus one ASI. Okay? You get a plus one ASI on the new 1 D&D. You bypass cover. New, firing and melee no longer poses disadvantage on attack rolls to ranged weapons. Range weapon, long range is no longer, is still, you know, no dis. But you lose your negative five to hit for 10 damage. And that was the whole point of being a uh, sharpshooter build was to basically have ridiculous chance to hit, which you could easily do if you have a magic bow, you have a fighting style for plus two, and you have arrows that also add um, your chance to hit and damage easily could have a plus 20 chance to hit easily by the late game you could have easily have a plus 20 chance to hit you have a plus two bow you have short you have fucking fighting style plus two and you have plus two arrows that's plus six right there okay um on top of everything else you would have so yeah this uh so you had a really good chance to hit and there was most of the time you wanted to take the negative five for the 10 only sometimes you didn't and now they just nerfed it it's just gone it's just gone okay it's stupid. Yeah. 
So the negative five to ten for ten damage needs to be added as just an optional rule for uh, D and D. Just straight optional rule in the rule book. If that's there, then I'm not going to be complaining as much. Sharpshooter is still good. It's still very, very good. Especially if you're playing a range or any kind of range character, it's still good. It's still very good. You need to take it if you're doing a range build. Enough said on that subject. <sighs> Shieldmaster. Okay. So, Shieldmaster. In 5e, if you take the attack action on your turn, you can use a bonus action to try and shove a creature within 5 feet of you with your shield. So, you move them back. <coughs> if you're incapacitated, if you aren't incapacitated... You can add your shield to AC bonus to any dexterity saving throw you make against a spell or harmful effect that targets you. So usually a plus two. If you have a rare shield, it could be a plus four. So, good. And this is the important bit. If you are subject to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw to take only half damage, you can use your reaction to take no damage if you succeed on the saving throw. Imposing your shield between yourself and the source of the effect. Yeah, basically had evasion if you took this feat on any character that uses a shield. So, in one d and you have to have shield training. You get ASI out of it to your strength. You get shield bash. If a creature within you, if a creature within five feet of you, as part of the attack action and hit and hit with a melee weapon, you can immediately bash the target with a shield if it is equipped, forcing the target to make a dexter a strength saving throw against your DC, which is eight plus your strength modifier. Blood pressure is On a fail, you knock the target prone or push it five feet away, and you can use this benefit only once per turn, once each on your turn, on each of your turns. So, what does this mean? Basically, if you take the attack action and you shield bash, you can use one of your melee things to shield bash him, making him go prone, and then you have advantage on all of your melee attacks against him. Yes, that is very good. Imposing shield. If you are subject to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw, you can only you can take only half damage. If you can use your reaction and take no damage, if you are succeed on the saving throw, wielding the shield, blah, 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 you have evasion. So... Shield Master, straight upgrade. You get ASI out of it. Shield Bash now can knock a target down or push them five feet away like it could before, but now it can knock them down so you have advantage. Um, you lose the ability to add your shield AC to your deck saving throw, so it's kind of saddening, but you keep the ability to take half damage or um, zero on a success on a dexterity one, so that's good. Um, upgrade it overall. I, I just take the new one, the new feat. It's just straight better. Just for the pure fact that you can shield bash somebody and then have advantage on all the attacks against them when they're on the ground skulker okay a little intense here let me a little little hard to explain how this fucking thing worked so in 5e you had to have dexterity of 13 or higher you could try to hide when you're lightly obscured from a creature from when from which you are hiding lightly of obs lightly obscured means that you basically had like a bush in your way a shrub or mist, or like heavy rain. N no DM that's worth their salt is going to fucking let you do it. So light obscurity was a thing you could do. It was very highly situational when Skulker was used. When you are hidden from a creature and miss it with a ranged attack, making the attack doesn't reveal your location. So basically, if you miss with an attack while you are hidden, you do not break your stealth. Dim light doesn't impose this advantage on your wisdom perception checks relying on sight. Pro tip, <coughs> DMs out there. And players too. If you will have dark vision, you do not see everything as you would if you had light. You see everything in black and gray. Basically like a dog. A dog can see in black and gray. You can see in color. If you're in a dark room with literally zero light, you will have disadvantage on your perception checks. Even if you have dark vision because you can't actually see much. <coughs> and not in color at all. That's your tip for you. So, what does Skulker do in one D&D? You have to have the dexterity of 13 again. You have an ASI increase, so that's better than the old fee was of one. You have blind sight within a range of 10 feet. Massive upgrade, okay? Blind sight in 10 feet lets you never get hit by an invisible enemy ever. And you can see everything that is invisible within 10 feet around you. So yeah, very good. Fog of War. Exploiting the distractions of battle, you have advantage on dexterity check stealth so you make a part of a hide action during combat. Okay, now this is very good on paper. If your DM is running raw, so rules is written, um, just abuse the shit out of this. Because if you got a cloak of elven kind, and you're if you got a cloak of elven kind, and you take like a, a wood uh, what is it wood elf, and they can hide and let the light the obscure terrain, you you can basically hide next to the dude and stab him multiple times, and he can't actually see you. Yeah, and also sniper. If you make an attack roll while hidden and the roll misses, making the attack roll doesn't end the hitting condition on you. 
combined with fog of war on a wood elf with with like a um a cloak of elven kind so you would just like blend into the fucking background um rules is written a dm you could literally be standing five feet away from a dude and hit him or miss five feet away from him and he has no idea you were there because it is no longer a range attack it, it, it's just an attack roll it can be anything so any dm worth their salt though is like dude you're five fucking feet you literally where my hand is from me there's no way he doesn't see you <coughs> so there you go that's uh yeah that's a thing you can do now <laughs> pair this with invisibility and yeah you're just gonna be stupid so massive upgrade compared to the original stall stall uh skulker so now you just really can't see in the dark with advanced with regular sight and you have disadvantage and also let a torch or candle or whatever so it's a very minor thing you get a plus one asi you get 10 feet 10 feet of blind sight massive hit advantage of, you have adv to hide in combat that is true you have advantage to hide in combat if you are not five feet away from someone you can actually hide with advantage it's great you lose the ability for dim lights not pose disadvantage on you um attacking while hidden hitting and missing does not reveal you same as before you lose the ability to hide in lightly obscured. Basically, sniper in one D and D is just better and can literally be next. So in one D and D, the sniper thing is just better than what it was in Five E, um, and you can miss a person by being next to them, as I've said. So if they use his rules of written, which nobody's gonna fucking do that. So there you go. Again, Skulker's actually not a half decently bad feat if you want to be one of those ranger types. I'll just say that, and you have ten feet of blind sight, so it is good. So there you go. Speedster. Speedster is mobile. Mobile, okay, in 5e, basically, your speed increased by 10 feet. You When you use a dash action, difficult terrain. It's not difficult terrain, it's normal. And when you make a melee attack against a creature, you don't provoke opportunity attack from that creature for the rest of the turn, whether you hit or not. You just have to wave your weapon at them, and then you can not use a disengage action, and you can just run away. This was absolutely vital for rogues or anybody that was a squishy front line that could do a lot of damage, but couldn't actually take it. That would be very good, okay? Speedster is what it is in one D&D now, okay? Dexterity or Constitution plus 13 is what you have to have. It's not repeatable. You get an ASI of Dex or Con plus one. While um, your speed increases by 10 feet while you aren't wearing heavy armor. So, unfortunately, you cannot wear heavy armor and uh, be mobile in 5e. So in 5e, you could have mobile and then have heavy armor on for 40 feet of movement speed. Can't do that anymore. Medium is the limit. I don't like that change. I think it's fucking stupid, but yeah, what am I going to do? Dash over difficult terrain. While you take the dash action on your turn, difficult terrain doesn't cause you extra movement for the rest of that turn. So, it's easy to take the dash action. Maybe if you're a rogue and they haven't come up with the rules yet, so I have no fucking idea. Maybe the dash action can be doing as a bonus action, and then that will still apply. But this feat is being a massive fucking downgrade, okay? You get a plus one ASI out of this. You lose the ability to run and to run 40 feet in heavy armor for some fucking stupid reason. You lose the ability to not provoke opportunity attacks if you wave your weapon at someone or hit them. That was the whole point in really taking mobile. The, the 10 feet was nice and the dashing for difficult terrain was also nice, but the real reason you took it was to not provoke opportunity attacks from creatures that you hit with a melee weapon that are within 5 feet of you and so you can run away. Um, and now you can't do that. So, it's a meh feat. I, I don't know why the fuck they decided to change mobile. Just add mobile back. That, that's all you have to do. Just add mobile back and you're good to go. Like, this feat is fucking actually dog shit. Just add mobile back with the plus one ASI and Baba da Boopy, you're better. I, I don't know why they changed this. Because it was already a niche feat to do. It was already a niche thing on a rogue. You have to be a rogue a melee build for this to work. For you to do mobile. So, <sighs> yeah. They should just add mobile back if you wanted my feedback response. Just add mobile back with the plus one ASI and get rid of speedster. Problem solved. <coughs> Spell Sniper. Spell Sniper in 5e was not very good at all. I'll just tell you right off the bat, it was not very good. So, your prerequisite basically you had to cast at least one spell. In 5e, you have to cast when you cast a spell that requires you to make an attack roll, the spell range is doubled. Your range spell attack ignore half cover and three quarters cover. You learn one cantrip that requires an attack roll, choose a cantrip from whatever class, your spell casting modifier, blah blah blah. <coughs> so your spell attack for attack roll spells, which are basically Eldritch Blast, anything that literally does not have a save, you have to actually hit, does not, and uh, would ignore half cover and three quarters cover, and you could double its range, which is like very few spells 
at all. And you learn a cantrip. Spell Sniper, on the other hand, in 1D and D is actually better. You can't have spell casting or packed magic feature. You have an ASI increase, right? Good. Straight overall upgrade of intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Bypass cover. You bypass cover. Cool. Casting a melee. Well, being within five feet of enemy doesn't impose this advantage on your attack rolls with spells. Basically, they add a crossbow expert in 5e, kind of the disadvantage or whatever. Two spell sniper, making it better. I like that. Increase range. When you cast a spell that has a range of at least 10 feet and then requires you to make an attack roll, you increase the spell range by 60 feet. Wow. So, overall, the feat is upgraded. Plus one ASI is good. Casting spells and melee no longer poses advantage. Nerfed range. Only 60 feet instead of double their attack range on attack spells. And you lose the ability to cast a cantrip or get one. So, there you go. It's still not very good. Um... Now, since they got rid of a lot of fucking spells that have been, you know, from Tasha's and all of that stuff, it's all gone. Um, this isn't very good. Maybe it'll get better over time, but it's still not very good. Um, it's a decent choice, I would say, for Caster, maybe. But I, I really wouldn't take it. Warcaster. Because Warcaster was already one of the top tier feats to ever take in 5e. Now they made it better, if you can believe that. In 5e, your prerequisite was the ability to cast at least one spell. You have to practice casting the blah, 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 blah. You have advantage on constitution uh, saving throws to maintain your concentration. Okay. You can perform the somatic components. Even when you have weapon and shields in both hands, you can basically be wearing heavy armor, shield, and sword and be casting actual spells with that. Um, and when a hostile creature movement provokes opportunity attack from you, you can use your reaction and cast a spell at the creature rather than making an opportunity attack. <coughs> the spell must have a casting time of one action and must target the creature. Basically, you took this, you took booming blade, and you hit the ass. Or you could really do it with a spell, but you'd have disadvantage on that range attack roll. However, Warcaster in 1 D&D gives you an ASI now, because apparently it wasn't already good enough. Now it's stupidly, now it's like one of the best feats in the fucking game. You have Vengeon Constitution, uh, saving throws to maintain your concentration. A reactive spell. When the creature provokes opportunity attack from you by moving out of your reach, you can use your reaction and cast a spell at that creature. Rather than making an opportunity attack, this, this spell must have a casting time of one action and must target only that creature. Somatic components. You can you can perform the somatic components of a spell even when you have a weapon or shield in both in one hand, okay? So, massive upgrade. Straight up massive upgrade in 1D&D. Plus 1 ASI. Same as before. Just a straight upgrade. However, there is no green flame blade or booming blade in D&D, 1D&D &D right now. Those don't exist. Okay? So you do actually, when you cast a spell, attack spell, it is going to be a disadvantage because you're within 5 feet of a creature unless you took Spell Sniper. Okay, if you don't take Spell Sniper, it's going to be disadvantage because there is no Green Flame Blade and no Booming Blade right now in 1D&D, the rules. Other than that, this whole feat's just fucking good. Now it's even better. It's like one of the best feats in the game. It is the best feat in the game for a Spellcaster. I'll eat my words. It is the best feat in the game for a Spellcaster. It literally does everything you need it to do for a Spellcaster. So there you go. Warcaster got massive upgrade. And weapon training. I believe this is the last fucking feat. So yeah, congratulations, boys. We made it almost. We made it all the way through the fourth level feats. Weapon training. Oh man, this feat was not very good in four and five e, and it's still fucking trash. So weapon master, you increase your strength or dexterity score. This is in five e by one to a max of twenty. You gain proficiency in four weapons. Can be simple and martial. That was dog shit. Okay. Weapon training in one D and D. No prerequisites. Not repeatable. You gain an ASI in your strength or dex, and you gain martial proficiency. Okay? Let me tell you, it's upgraded. You gain proficiency in all of martial weapons at four. It's a literally useless feat. Just multi-class once. Yes. Take a rule, look at the rule set. If you go into Ranger, one level of Ranger, you get martial weapons, you get medium armor, and you get shields and light armor. They're they're not doing individual weapons anymore. It's just straight all martial weapons. Um, or none. So either simple or martial weapons, you get all martial weapons. Just take a goddamn multi-class in something. If you wanted to actually have martial weapons, and just do that. Never take this feat. This feat is fucking worthless. I honestly just think it'd be better getting rid of this feat, but I mean, hey, you do have an option. It is an option. Literally the worst feat in 1D&D. &D. Congratulations. It was one of the, it was the worst feat in 5e, and it is still the worst feat in 1D&D. &D. Congratulations. We have done it. We have completed all the fighting uh, feats.
in one D&D. &D. So if that's all you came for, that's good to go. Um, otherwise, I'm going to cover fighting styles and boons now. So, <sighs> fighting styles. These are the fighting styles in one D&D. &D. They haven't changed much. The fighting styles that have changed is protection has gotten nerfed to a negative two instead of disadvantage. Okay? So it used to be you can impose your re you impose your shield as a reaction and you give disadvantage on the attack roll for the for basically um, an enemy that's trying to attack your ally. Now it's a negative two. That's just straight fucking worse. Don't take this fighting style anymore. Archery is still broken. Archery gives you a plus two on attack rolls for range weapons. Where the fuck is my plus two to attack rolls on weapons? On melee weapons. They need to fix this. If you are still listening to me and that f that thing is open, please write in there. Fighting style. Melee weapon master. Plus two attack rolls with melee weapons. That's all it is. It needs to be in there because right now there is no reason to not. <laughs> if you want to max your build, even if you don't want to max your build, it is straight the best fighting style in the game because of the plus two. Two attack rolls on all ranged weapons. It There needs to be an offset for melee guys, but there's not. And it needs to be. So I will write that in there myself, but I would encourage you to also write in there that archery needs a counterpart called like uh, melee master, and you gain a plus two bonus to attack rolls when you with uh, melee weapons. Need to make a fighting style for plus two as I've just gone over for melee weapons. <sighs> Otherwise, everything else is the same as it is on your screen. They haven't changed much besides protection for some awful reason. Don't know why they did that. Okay. Boons. Okay. So, last slide. Boons are unlocked at level twenty. Okay. You must take a twentieth level in one class to access them. Level 18 is in 1 D&D &D is what level 20 is in 5e. Okay? Level 20 in 5e was your capstone ability that's maxed, okay? That's now level 18 in 1 D&D. &D. That just means you get your shit faster. I think that's a good change overall. If they're going to do level 20, just lower the shit to 18, and that's what they did. These are the same boons. At level 20, you get a boon, okay? Um, when you do get a boon, you can choose any of these. These are the same boons as they are in 5e, and they're not changed. Some are just way better than others. Some are just way better than others. Um, for example, if you take uh, dimensional time travel, it is uh, just straight uh, trash compared to like 30 proficiency in all skills and an increased movement speed by 30. So there you go. I think my laptop's playing in the background, but... I don't know what the fuck happened there. Anyway, so that's Boons, and that's all the feats for 1D&D. &D. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you uh, use the time cards down there. Um, again, there will be in the description the ability to go right to them if it's the 20th of October and all the way till it's closed. Please go right to them about what you think about your feats or whatever. Please, it would maybe change some of them. Um, other than that, all, all of you have a good day, and if you like this video, please leave a like. I will make more videos if this one's popular enough. So, cool. All right, see people later.